The world of The Last of Us is dangerous. Unless you're living in a protected area, there is something lethal around every corner. Once you venture out of your home, you're in danger. And where we're taking the story and where we're taking Ellie is like each step of the way, she's putting herself in more and more danger to bring these people to justice. I would say that the world, in every sense of the word, is bigger than The Last of Us Part One, both in scale and the amount of physical space that exists for you to explore, for you to encounter other people. Yeah, this route has its perks. Our hope is to make every corner a challenge, make every decision hard for Ellie. And so we do that not just in the gameplay you experience, but also in the level design. So part of that is making certain experiences really hostile, be it through weather or through rivers or, or craggy cliffs or slick snow. But we also use it in terms of how blind the player is. Like, what can they see? How safe do you feel? Can you see a threat coming around the corner? You never know if the bullets in your gun are gonna be enough. You never know if you can stop and bandage your arm. You can never fully breathe. And we want you to be in alignment with Ellie, who can never fully breathe when she experiences this trauma. For Jackson specifically, we wanted to make it feel like a very close-knit kind of community that's focused on family, focused on sustainable ways of living. I obviously have the hydroelectric dam generator that's powering the town, so we have you know, electricity in Jackson, which is not something that maybe players would expect to see in the world. But given that we're further in time, we wanted to show that there are certain people dedicated in the world to rebuilding a life that doesn't revolve around killing people and, and scavenging. As you walk around the town, you can hear kids laughing. You could see um, people going into restaurants and eating, and it's a very kind of tranquil town. Now, we know there's all these horrible things happening outside the walls, but they've been able to protect the innocence of, of this town. Jackson, in many ways, represents what is at stake for our characters, a, a life of peace and relative comfort, uh, a life where you can fall in love, a place where children can play and it's OK. And I think you know, when we were looking at building out Jackson, it's like, okay, how many of those moments can we represent? What's awesome about the world of The Last of Us is it shows just how precious the things that we take for granted in our everyday lives, how precious those things really are. Seattle compared to Jackson is uh, very different. It's more of a war zone, I would say. Part of the interesting thing with Seattle or the Pacific Northwest is that there's all this rain and all this foliage and wildlife, and it's this very lush area that if someone were to sell down, it'd be a pretty good place to sell down just as far as the kind of fruit you can scavenge, the animals you can hunt. And then because it is so lush, because it is so um, teeming with resources, is why there are multiple factions trying to fight over those resources. <laughs> One faction you run into in Seattle is the Washington Liberation Front. When the outbreak happened, the military took some pretty drastic actions and quarantined parts of the country. And this was their way of protecting the population that has survived this horrendous outbreak. And because of that, it led to rise of these resistance groups. And in the first game, we saw the Fireflies. And we heard about other groups, and in this game we get to see, here's another group that rose called the Washington Liberation Front that was able to defeat the army and thereby take over a lot of their equipment. And they're this very militaristic faction. And at the same time, you have the Seraphites. And they're a religious group that also came up out of the outbreak that believed that the pandemic came because of sin. They're trying to reset the world and return it to a better place than it was. In The Last of Us, almost any group that has survived this long has to be dangerous. Um, if you're not dangerous, you're not gonna survive. You're gonna become someone's victim. And the two factions you run into are both very dangerous. The WLF has a lot of military equipment, 
that they're able to use to defend the area and they have large numbers, whereas the Seraphites are very quiet and stealthy and able to use the large amount of foliage to their advantage and they fight more in this kind of guerrilla warfare. How you deal with them is going to be different because they have different language, they have different communication style, the scars will whistle to each other with this different language. And they have some of the stuff that you have. You have a bone arrow, they can hit you with arrows and impale you and you have to pull the arrow out. They have big sledgehammers and melee weapons. The WLF, they have trained dogs that will sniff and attack you. Dogs are a new level of threat that Ellie hasn't had to negotiate before, and hopefully they create a new complicated choice for the player. We saw in them an opportunity to, to challenge people's perceptions of what a combat setup can be. We wanted to find really hard choices. The dogs themselves have names. They're called out by their owners. We wanted every setup to be challenging. How many do you think it would take to bring down a moose? Infected are still a threat in this world. We wanted to take first our basic classes that we had in the first game and say, okay, how do we, what's different about them now? So we'll have scenarios where way more runners, like we can have hordes sometimes of runners coming after you and it might be about just escaping because the odds are just overwhelming. You know, this thing just keeps mutating. There's, there's certain evolutions of infected that you haven't seen before, certain new classes. There's the shamblers, which kind of have these exploding acid clouds uh, when you get near them. You're running down a hallway and you have to suddenly make a decision like, oh, do I want to take the damage and go through this cloud or find some other route or go back the way I came? And it kind of forces you to on the fly kind of make new decisions about how you're going to deal with uh, the threat behind you or potentially in front of you. So again, it's about how do we make fighting against infected intelligence. So when you come on a space, you're listening to audio cues because different classes will make different sounds. If you just go in guns blazing and throw caution in the wind, you could easily get overwhelmed and regret that strategy. That level of uncertainty and instability is something our characters have to carry with them every day as they go out into the world to protect the people they love most. And that threat is banging on their door every day. I really hope you make it. PlayStation.